This is not a test. Stay calm and in an orderly fashion make your way to the lifeboats. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Lifeboat Addiction Recovery Cast. Um, so if you've been following us for the last couple of weeks, on Mondays, we've been talking about the stages of change, which are pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. So kind of walking through those, um, we have our pre-contemplation, you know, I'm not ready to change yet. My life's not that much turmoil. Any turmoil is not caused by my addiction. Then we have contemplation. Contemplation is going to be, okay, I see my use is responsible for some of the things that are happening to me. So maybe I should do something about it. Then we got preparation. Yep. Preparation is just going to be, okay, so now we've realized there's a problem. What can I do about it? I'm going to start putting things in place in order to make it possible for me to go and get whatever help I need. Yep. And then we'll have action. Action, of course, is like, okay, rubber hits the road. I'm going to treatment. I'm going to the meetings. I'm going to the intensive outpatient IOP. I'm doing something about it, which finally leads us into maintenance. Right. So maintenance, we have our just sustaining recovery, right? This is usually going to last through the rest of our recovery. We might slide back a little bit at times, but we're going to be in this maintenance stage. We're going to be maintaining our recovery. And then we have our last stage, which will break maintenance. And that is relapse. Yeah. And relapse is really, it's depending on what model you're with and what agency you're with. There's a lot of things about relapse. Oftentimes it's just worked its way into the stages of change so that we understand that there, this is a natural portion of recovery relapses. I'm going right on back to my old ways, my old habits. I'm starting to slip. Remember we talked last week about relapse manifesting itself oftentimes in the behaviors and in the thought process before the drugs are ever used, before the bottle is ever drank, before the needles ever in the arm, before the pipe is ever smoked. Right. Usually it will start manifesting in behaviors, attitudes, and emotions. Right. So when you're in the maintenance stage, you start mushrooming off into the stages of recovery. Those stages are stabilization, deepening, uh, connectedness, integration, integra integration, and fulfillment. Um, Go now, ahead. the these five stages, once again, are going to be mushroomed out inside of maintenance, but they're all going to generally build off of each other. You will see that there is some fluidity, just like there's some fluidity in, fluidity in the stages of change. You know, we see contemplation, and then we can see somebody kind of in the action stage. If you remember, we talked about from contemplation, preparation to action. It can go in a heartbeat. Right. And then really when we get down to the maintenance stage, it's I've been in the action stage for no less than six months, oftentimes more than six months. Right. And I'm starting to integrate things into my life that are going to last for long-term recovery. If you remember, I use kind of the analogy of a piece of coal you're in early uh, early recovery, yet piece of coal is slowly going to be formed out through the action stage, heat pressure, heat pressure, learning to do things the right way, learning to have healthy coping mechanisms, healthy feelings, all mm -hmm. those kinds of stuff without freaking out and then going to use again. And over time, it goes into the diamond. But with the diamond, now it's time to polish. Now right. it's time to get it up to that caliber that we want it. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the maintenance stages. And yes, if anybody heard that in the background, that was in fact <laughs> Hunter's cell phone going off Yet again, what there has I not say? been a cast right. yet where Hunter, that's going to be the Easter egg is yeah. people send us in the time marker and yes, Hunter's <laughs> cell phone went off at this time. But I'm a millennial. What can I say? Uh, yeah. That is completely unjustifiable. <laughs> I can't believe you just said that. All right. So let's go ahead and jump straight into our stages of recovery. Now, before we really get down deep into this, there's a couple of things that you really, really need to know about the stages of recovery. And that first and foremost is, once again, they are not linear. Yeah. That means that you, there is going to be fluidity somewhat through the stages of recovery, but there is oftentimes going to be things that you need to do before you keep moving on. There are oftentimes inside of the latter forms of recovery where you have to get really, really clear on some things about yourself and about other things. Are you just, you can't progress forward because it's going to take a constant commitment to those things. Things like honesty, things like truth, things like integrity. Mm -hmm. Those are things that you're going to have to build upon. You're going to have to learn more about, and then you're going to have to pursue them later on. Right. I think another really important comment on the stages of change is that you might be in two different stages or two stages of recovery rather. You might be in two different stages at the same time. You, you could have could some some things that are in the, the stabilization chain or stage and some that are in deepening, you know, it, it really depends. So, and the stages of recovery, just like the stages of change for those of you who are listening, who might have a loved one or significant other, for those of you who might be students, or for those of you who are just in recovery yourselves and are trying to learn more about this thing, the reality is 
first and foremost, we will always encourage people not to use this as a bailiwick or as, as you know, the beat stick that you go into the meetings and be like, I'm in a stage of recovery higher than you are. So therefore I know more. No, don't do that. Right, right. And at the set, so don't judge other people based upon what you perceive yourself to be in or what you perceive them to be in. Mm -hmm. That's number one. But number two, don't put the cart before the horse. There are going to be things in the stages of recovery and we're going to talk about them, but the reality is there's so much more. Once again, if you want to learn more about these things, go to recovery coach Academy, you know, go to, you can find them online. You can find them uh, all over the place. They're being put on all over the nation. C cars. We will always suggest going to anybody running a C car Connecticut community on addiction recovery coach Academy. Fantastic. Definitely. AKA RCA as it is. Um, but at the end of the day, when we're talking about the stages of recovery, you may see yourself as wanting to be in one place and you may be in a different place. Right. You may see yourself as like, well, I see so much of integration inside of me. I see, you know, I, I'm having the wisdom and the knowledge of people that are six, seven, eight years in recovery more than I am. And I'm only, a, you know, six months into this or a year into this. Right. First, okay. Slow down. Uh, slow down. Right. That's okay to be slow when it comes mm -hmm. to this stuff. It's okay to pump the brakes right. because the moment that you start walking into the room, especially in early recovery and really in later recovery, I don't think it really matters when the moment you start walking into a room, believing that you know everything and there's nothing that anybody can teach you, you are in a world of hurt very right. quickly. You know, they always say, uh, you know, I've always been told my best thinking is what got me to my addiction. So um, when I start relying on my own thinking again and thinking that it's correct and everything that I do and I'm not willing to listen to outside advice, it's kind of a sticky situation I can find myself in very fast. And man, I can't tell you how many people they shut out that external voice. And right. remember, external voice is the voice of the people that that are able to talk into your life that you trust to talk in your life versus your internal voice, which is the thoughts and what you have in your own head, you know, that gut feeling of what should I do? How should I do it? Now let's jump into the stages of recovery. Sounds so good. right off the bat, we're going to be talking about stabilization. <laughs> now stabilization is a rather unique one because this is one that oftentimes people are, are really shaky on. Right, they right. just getting into recovery. They're just understanding, you know, they have that really that usually that six month mark that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, listen to, to, uh, last week's podcast in the stages of change, we talked specifically about from action to maintenance, you're always going to have six months, right. you, you're not going to have less than six months, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But there are some people that aren't necessarily in action stage, because, you know, even though they have six months or more, they're not in the act are necessarily in the maintenance stage, I should say. Right, yeah. Right. And why is that? Well, I mean, sometimes it just takes a uh... It takes a lot more time for some people. Everyone's a little bit different with their with their learning rate or maybe their absorption rate or maybe they're not satisfied with how much they have got yet. So they're going to continue to seek after as if they were in an action phase before they get into that maintenance. Yeah, and it, it can also come down to, like I said, this is we're, this is somewhat unique to the, our agency. However, it's not necessarily unique to to everybody. There are other agencies that do this, but when somebody's in treatment, we don't necessarily consider them to be in, in uh, side of the action stage or right. actively working the action stage yet. Meaning they are in the action stage, but that six month marker that we like to count, we're not necessarily going to start counting that yet. And the reason for that is because the individual, they are in an isolated place. They're right. in a controlled environment that, you know, they may not absorb it. They may go there and think that treatment is like summer camp and they're not, you know, they're not taking it seriously. They're just like three hots in a cot. And that happens quite a bit. But end of the day, they're in a controlled, a semi controlled environment where the problems of the world don't right. come crashing in on and us. the routine and responsibility is put upon them in a forcible manner it's not something they can choose so. absolutely and once again we're not saying they're not in the action stage but we're saying that you should you should be cautious about starting the timer yet mm -hmm. because when when the person when the world starts crashing back in that's really where you're going to get into that okay how do we navigate this action stage with them? And there's plenty enough people that say well we'll start the action stage right as they go into treatment because they're not using it. you know what that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's completely fine. Mm -hmm. Just kind of how we do it and how we look at it. And here's this, we, we've had plenty enough people that get three, four months into it. And we're like, they're nearing the end of the action stage. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, they're, they're right at it, but there's other people that we've had go through treatment, you know, doing the thing, doing the thing. And they're eight months into their action stage. And we're like, dude, I don't even know if they're ready to hop into to a legit maintenance yet because right. they're, they're key, you know, same people, places and things. They're just kind of, I'm, I'm going to, do this my own way, which is fine. We believe in the multiple pathways, but we're always hesitant because we're like, man, 
that tree, that fruit on that tree is real low right now. And it's right. very easy to fall back into that because you're not exercising any of your recovery tools inside your toolkit. Yeah. And I'll say it's not that we think someone is like your recovery pathway is not, not legitimate. It's that, okay, I've seen a lot of people go down the same path to keep around the same people and do the exact things you're doing. And it's never in the world for them. So yeah. I mean, it's a, experiential right. knowledge for us. We've, mm-hmm. we've done this. We've taught a lot of people and we've done this with a lot of people. And reality is, guess what? Everybody's different. That being said, patterns of behavior, you can start to identify. And it's just, it goes down to that archetypal thing. We can start to identify patterns of behavior. You can start to talk to people and generally get a sense of where they're coming from before they really have to say it sometimes. Right. And it, that's, that's a normal part of human nature. Anybody that works in the human services field for more than a year starts to get that second, that spidey sense. They get the, there's something going on here. Right, there's something right. underneath the surface and they're able to call it out before they go ahead. And sometimes they're able to call exactly what it is out just because of experiential knowledge. Now mm-hmm. it's not going to be that way for everybody. And we, by no means as recovery coaches, treat everybody the same, even if we feel like there's a very similar situation going on. We treat everybody uniquely, right. but it's just something that it's like, okay, we can probably sidestep this process because I think I generally know what's going on here. Mm-hmm. And we have that conversation with the individual. So going over stabilization, stabilization is going to be that time and the couple year marker, you know, mm-hmm. you know, one, two, maybe three rarely four, but one, two, three years, they're going to get a place in their life where they're, where they're actually starting to see serious growth. Right. And this is often where we see the pink cloud start to develop. Now, mm-hmm. Hunter, you want to tell them what the pink cloud is or cloud nine, or it's go by a dozen different names. Right. So, I mean, I've seen this develop really early in recovery and later on, like in this stage, the um, stabilization stage. And that's basically believing that now we're immune. Um, there's nothing that can touch me anymore. You know, a trigger's never going to never going to bother me again. I can go back around the same or old people and go save them with that. Uh, we call it the Messiah complex. You mm-hmm. know, I can go back and I can save my old friends who used to use or whatever the situation, but yep. basically thinking that now you have some sort of immunity. So, and I, I love the way that you put that. It's the, the Messiah complex. Mm-hmm. Like I've got this under control. Therefore, you know, this was the most difficult portion of my life that I've ever went through. And I now have it under control, or at least they perceive to have it under control. Now I'm able to tell the world of what is going on and I'm able to show them what's what, because if I can overcome this, I can overcome everything. And it's like, yeah, okay, maybe. Yeah, sure. I, I went through that myself, the Messiah complex. I, when I came back from Iowa, um, at some point during my recovery, I started reaching out to people on Facebook that I used to use with and be like, hey, man, if you ever need any help, let me know. And I can, you know, and it's like, that was the dumbest thing I ever did, mm-hmm. to be honest, because really those people don't want your help. You know, really, they, if anything, they're going to pull you back down to their level. You're not going to pull them up to yours. So, yeah, it's very, I mean, that's your perfect, perfect point. Hit the nail right on the head of it's more likely they are going to pull you back down to where you were than you are going to pull them up to where you are now. Right. And that's not saying don't, don't be a hand there. You know, if someone comes to you and is like, Hey, I need help. I need to get in recovery. Sure. Throw them some resources that you know of. Sure. But right. at the same time, especially in early recovery, you have to protect yourself. Mm-hmm. Got to, got to, got to protect yourself. Somebody comes up to you while you're in early recovery and they, and they are doing that. Maybe somebody that you used to use with in the past, uh, you know, Hey man, I need help. Hey man, I need help basically means like, oh, you can go to this agency and they'll help you can go. Exactly. Give them a phone number. Exactly. Right. Not, Hey, stay on my couch and I will help don't you out. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't do, do that. That. Yeah. that. You were putting yourself in serious jeopardy. I don't care you how do long you have in recovery. Don't ever let someone you active addiction come and stay at your house. I'm just going to throw it out there. In my opinion was <laughs> wisdom from Hunter. Right. So yeah, with, with uh, stabilization though, there's, there's going to be a lot of really, really key markers that mm-hmm. an individual starts to go through. Once again, paint cloud, definitely going to be there that that sense of i can conquer the world the sense of rah rah sis boom ba now there's a couple of reasons for this and there's uh we like to use the analogy of there's a train coming with your name on it you better you might want to hop off the tracks Mm -hmm. the reason people get to the pink cloud place is because so many things are happening so quickly and they're all successful. Right. All of a sudden, they're making leaps and bounds, and they have a target in their life, and they're getting they're getting the education, they're getting their life back, house back, kids back, car back, whatever it might be. They're right. they're getting it back. This is dangerous, and it's it's an amazing thing to watch. It's transformative. It is a miracle that it is happening, but it's dangerous when those things start to slow down, because they will. It's not a matter of if, but when right. nobody, I've not met one person and there's not one person out there that had all those things and then kept on going for the foreseeable future. And is now the most successful person I've ever met in my entire life. Right. Like there is always going to be obstacles and there's always going to be things that take a lot more work than just one day mm-hmm. or one week. 
Right. I mean, when you're talking about early recovery, you're seeing people that were homeless, living on the street, um, using using substances every day, whether it be alcohol, drugs, doesn't matter. All of a sudden, stop using substances. Yep. Start to feel some dopamine come back in a little bit here and there, you know, start to feel good again, start to meet new people in recovery, start to get into a group. They get a house, you know, they're they're getting a job and like things are progressing rapidly. Mm -hmm. But then it's like bigger steps. Right. So now now I might go back to school. Now I might do this. And it's, it's a lot longer. It's a hard it's a hard bre uh, it's a hard wall to hit, you know. Absolutely. Now, inside of stabilization, there's going to be a lot of things that are happening. So we're, we're talking about the formation of, you know, the base set of principles that are going to help sustain your recovery for the long run. And too often we see people that want to skip steps here. Mm -hmm. They want to go ahead or when they hit a block or a road mark because everything else in their life is being successful and moving very quickly on side of that pink cloud, they hit a block or road mark. They come at it with the mentality of like, then it's not meant to happen. It's out of my way. I'm going to keep on going forward. And it's like, you got to be careful because there's mm -hmm. going to be things that are absolutely like that. But there's going to be other things like creating a stable community around you, stable right. recovery around you, stable uh, external voices around you who are going to be able to talk in your life. Mm -hmm. You don't get to sidestep that. Those are not things that you get to sidestep and find continued success. Right. You may at first, but in the long run, you will regret it because right. those are going to be the, the everybody. And I don't care who you are. Everybody in recovery around the year mark, around the year and a half mark, <clears throat> they start to feel that itch. They start to feel like what am I doing? Why, why am I not progressing any further more? Right. Why, why am I not getting as much as I want? And that's when the, you know, the, the devil and the angel pop on the shoulder and the devil starts to say, use, mm -hmm. it, you could be doing the same thing. You could be at least having fun, right? Get, call your old friends, call your dealer, call, you know, mm -hmm. call your homies back into it. And it, you know, you hit them up on Facebook and I can't tell you how many people, and it's, it's a weird circumstance that happens. They don't hit them up, but all of a sudden they're having those feelings. And guess what? So somebody hits them up. Yeah. Somebody hits yep. them up. How often does that happen? I've seen it happen time. It's so strange because it's like when temptation would actually affect somebody when they're at that point in their recovery is when temptation comes their way. Yep. It's, it is, it's, it's really crazy. It's a unique thing. Well, and it's a unique thing. And I think, it, you know, a lot of it has to do with just, you know, whether you want to call it serendipity or what, but it, at the end of the day, it has to do with, there are going to be things that work out there in the universe that are going to come into your way, whether you believe in, uh, you know, divine power or science, they're just, those are natural things that are going to come along. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the dealer, maybe he was shorted this last month and he needs to get that money back. So he's going to hit you up. Those things are eventually going to happen. Right. If, and when they happen is going, it's completely up to chance, but the reality is oftentimes they're going to hit you when you're at your low, mm -hmm. you're at that place. And the, the important point as a recovery is like, don't zero into that. Don't zero into like, oh, oh, you know, is this, you know, is this a divinity? Is this Satan? Is this what, what, what is happening right now? I can't believe this is right. happening. It's like, it's a moment in time. The best thing you can say is no, mm -hmm. no, thank you. And right. walk away. Yeah. And that's, we've talked about this. I think we talked about it last episode or at some point during uh, knowing uh, red flags and green flags of recovery, your relapse signs. Um, have something prepared. Yeah. You know, like if somebody, if you, if you, especially if you're living in the same town that you used in, have something ready to say to people when they come up to you. Like for me, I go back to Iowa to visit my family, never fails, always run into people I used to use with. Every time I leave my house, you know, I go buy a pack of cigarettes and there's the dope man up at the gas station. Yep. It is, where have you been? Cause I disappeared two and a half years ago. I'm like, mm -hmm. Oh, I moved up to Michigan. I got clean. I'm a peer recovery coach now. And, uh, you know, and just start going on. And it's like, I hit him with the bam, 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 bam. So it shuts the conversation down right there. Mm -hmm. Have something you can say, because when temptation hits, you don't want to rely on those improv skills. Exactly. It's, it's really, it'll get you in a lot of heat in a real quick hurry. Now in stabilization, uh, one of the things you also want to do is, is start learning more about the addiction, mm -hmm. start learning more of science or more right. things. And here's the thing, when we say learning, it doesn't have to be the intellectual learning of like, well, you know, the dopamine receptors and uh, this <laughs> many, you know, millime milliliters and this, it doesn't have to be right. right. But start learning more about meetings, mm -hmm. whatever avenue you choose to find your recovery, start throwing yourself into deep it, in, deep in it. Absolutely. Deepen that understanding of it. Deepen your uh, deepen your understanding of the twelve steps. Work mm -hmm. the twelve steps with right. a sponsor. Deepen your understanding of you know smart recovery. What does it mean? For, what is cognitive behavioral therapy going to help you with? Right. Deepen these steps so that you can get a really really thick undercoat of like okay, 
what am I supposed to do here? How am I supposed to be here? Because, you know, it, just with everything else, uh, I, it might've been Mike Dick, uh, but anyways, it, what, he says repetition is a branding iron of success. Mm -hmm. Just as Hunter said, you have to get in a place where you are repeating those steps. You are, you're, for lack of a better term, you're kind of brainwashing yourself and you're, yeah. you're, you're becoming so entrenched and so indulgent in what recovery is for you mm -hmm. that when those temptations come up, when those people from your past come up, it's, it's just, you know, it, it's second nature. You right. immediately are back to like, no, I'm good. Right. You know, and if you don't have those things, you really need to start working on them, especially for those, uh, those of you who are listening, who may be in what we'd consider young recovery, mm -hmm. you should get a deepening of what you understand recovery and addiction to be so that you can stop yourself from doing it later on. Right. Right. So other stuff that can really come up for you is um, developing responsibility. And oh, we, yeah. we, talk about this time and time in, in stabilization, talk about this time and time with early recovery. You want to break apart responsibility a yeah. little bit? Best thing or worst thing that can happen in somebody's recovery is when responsibility hits. I mean, it's, it's that now I have bills to pay. I have, I have my dog to take care of. I got a girlfriend and I got to give her some attention, you know, whatever it might be. I got my job. I got to go to from nine to five, Monday through Friday, you know, whatever, whatever it looks like for you that can be either really good or it can be an overbearing load on somebody. So 100%. it's all about balance. It's about maintaining your own recovery, but responsibility really, we can't grow without. It is a, it's something that's in life that we can't get rid of. It's always going to be there no matter what you do, no matter what you follow, it doesn't matter. There's always going to be responsibility there. So learning to cope with that is, is just amazing in recovery. And it, for those of you who, who've listened over the last uh, couple of weeks, You've probably heard us say on a multitude of occasions that, you know, the only two reasons, there's a lot of reasons why somebody can relapse, but really they come down usually to two, which are unpacked trauma and unmet potential, unmet potential. So unpacked trauma, what is that? Unpacked trauma. So whatever made you use in the first place, whether that be childhood trauma or trauma that happened maybe later on in your life, whatever it might be not working through that is going to lead you back into the addictive behavior that it led you to in the first place. Absolutely. And what's unfulfilled potential? Unfulfilled potential is exactly what it sounds like. So whatever potential, whatever you're striving towards, not working towards that goal, not making anything out of your recovery. And all it takes to find purpose, all it takes to start filling that potential is two things. It's really only two. And the problem is, is these two are the two most difficult things, even for people outside of recovery. They're the most difficult things for, I think, us as human beings to get, which is responsibility mm -hmm. is one, which is the, those things that we're taking upon ourselves to be responsible to, that we will get them done, and self-discipline. But right. willing to wake up at the same time, willing to make your bed, willing to do this, do that. And there's so much research that has uh, been done about this. One of the things that we talk about as far as making responsible, you know, taking responsibility or, or self-discipline right off the bat, for those of you who are either in your life in maybe later forms of recovery or early recovery, there's a couple of things that you should do, you know, first thing in the morning before you make anything else happen. First and foremost, make your bed, mm -hmm. wake up, make your bed, choose a room in your house, clean it up. Don't, don't let you know, don't become overwhelmed. Right. If your house is dirty, if you, if it hasn't been cleaned in a while, if you're feeling a certain kind of way about that, don't be overwhelmed, set a goal out. I'm going to make this one room and I'm going to clean it up. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to fold my laundry. I'm going to make it smell nice. Maybe I'll buy a $10 candle from, you know, the dollar Mart or Myers or something. Right. I'm going to make my bed. I'm going to do the next, you know, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. The next thing that you can do Make a protein breakfast, man. Mm -hmm. Dollar, dollar and 26 cents. Go get your eggs right now down at the quality dairy, at least in Michigan. Right. You can probably find them for two bucks, three bucks down at the gas station or wherever, or, you know, wherever eggs are sold. Right. You know, go get it. <laughs> make a protein breakfast. Store. Yeah. Make a protein, high protein right. breakfast early in the morning. It makes for a, a, a good thing, right? It, yeah. it, it starts those endorphins. It starts serotonin levels and dopamine levels in your body. Nice There's little energy boost. Nice yeah. energy boost in the morning. We've all have probably had that midday grouchiness. You know, we've all seen the Snickers commercial. You're not yourself when you're hungry. Here, eat a <laughs> Snickers. There's as stupid as it is. There is science behind that. You know, cortisol, which is the stress hormone, starts to be produced in us. We start getting frustrated. We start becoming angry. So eat that high protein breakfast in the morning. Do not load up on sugar and fat in the morning. Yep. Don't pour, you know, three bowls of cereal in the morning. Don't eat just pop tarts in the morning, have protein. Don't, you know, try to cut carbs back, but protein is really going to help mm -hmm. you in the morning and sugar is going to kill you in the morning. It's right. not going to do anything for you. And then the third thing, 
which is, you know, right off the bat, we tell all of our recoveries this, we tell all of our recovery coaches that we teach this, wake up at the same time. What we know about circadian rhythm, what we know about uh, sleep studies now is, yes, it is important for the average adult to get anywhere from seven to nine hours of sleep, depending on age and depending on a uh, level of, of activity that they do in the midst of uh, any given day. That's number one. Number two, in those circadian sleep studies, one thing that they found out is it is more important for you to wake up at the same time that it is necessarily for you to go to bed at right. the same believe, time. Uh, Jordan Peterson talks about that. Yes. Right? Jordan yeah. Peterson, uh, Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. He's a uh, influential psychologist. He's wrote from in Canada from, from Canada, yeah, from, from Canada. Canada. <laughs> um, but he's written a, a litany of books. I believe he's about to release uh, another one, 12 more rules for life. I think it's called. Oh, really? Yeah. It's, okay. it's like a March. I believe. So it's an expansion on the original. But, yeah. But 12 Very rules cool. for life and antidote to chaos. Really, really good book does uh, uh, book. get, get gets you zeroed in on, on some things and just talks uh, a lot about responsibility, but he is somewhat of a political figure and mm -hmm. somewhat of a political pariah. So we're not going to bring too much up about that, but and he does you... have, and as far as his, his uh, teachings go, because he was a, a professor at university of Alberta. He was a professor at Harvard university at one point. Um, he is a very influential psychologist. He is somebody that knows what they're talking about. And he does quite a bit of talking about right. different sleep studies, different things like that. So it definitely, it, if you're ever interested, definitely worth a look. Yeah. And if you're like me, you know, make sure you have your uh, dictionary handy for the words that you don't know. A thesaurus. <laughs> yes. No, but one of the things that we, we talk to them about is waking up at the same time, mm -hmm. set an alarm, wake up. You got to bully yourself. This is where uh, not only responsibility, but this is where self-discipline comes in. You got right. to wake up at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, because if you're waking up at six one day and eight the next day, and then, you know, four in the morning, the next day that it's not going to go well for you. So get that going. But the reason we talk about these things in early recovery and early stabilization is we want easy goals that mm -hmm. can be met early on that are goals that over time, they'll compile. Right. And we're literally in this stage, we are quite literally building a stabilization of one's life. Absolutely. That is, and that's what these goals do. So you're waking up at the same time, you're getting up, you're making a breakfast, uh, whatever it might be, you know, high protein eggs, maybe you have just have a protein drink because you don't really like to eat in the morning, whatever. You're getting up and you're doing the same thing. You're creating a rhythm. Yes. And it's, it's just stabilizing. It, it brings peace and order to a life. Absolutely. Now, inside of this stage, one thing will, uh, one last thing I think we'll say, and then we'll move on to the next mm -hmm. stage. But inside of this stage, it is of the utmost importance that you start to surround yourself with community. Mm -hmm. It is of the utmost importance that you check your ego at the door. Mm -hmm. I'll say it again. Check your ego at the door. Do not believe that you know more than anybody else there. You're going to get in a world of hurt. Right. Guess what? You may know a lot. You very well may. You may know a crazy amount about a bunch of things mm -hmm. and you could be very well right on a bunch of different things, but nothing, there's going to be no knowledge that compares to sitting down with somebody that is 30 years, your senior in right, recovery, right. that is 20 years, your senior in your recovery, because where you may be able to intellectualize it and get into the like, well, this is what this says. And scientifically that yada, yada, mm -hmm. yada, I've sat down with several, <laughs> not a lot, but several in my lifetime of people that, that look at it from the scientific basis. And they mm -hmm. were people who struggle with addiction. They're now in recovery mm -hmm. and science says this and this and this and this. And I just have to say, okay, hold up, stop. Right. You can intellectualize this all you want. You don't know what you're talking mm -hmm. about. You may know how to, how, you know, for quantum physics, right. you may know there's depths of knowledge that I have no clue about. One thing I do know clue, clues about is how underline how recovery works for people. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to keep on pouring out, pouring out, pouring out and acting like you're the smartest one in the room, mm -hmm. I promise you within a year, you'll relapse. Yeah, I love, I love. Um, so in, in NA, we call them the predecessors or the old timers mm -hmm. and sitting down with one of those people that got 20 some years in recovery and they say something and it's like so simple, but it's like profound you know it's like you <laughs> that said, old man sitting <laughs> under the tree and be like thanks for the wisdom yeah, old time. <laughs> exactly and it is it is just it's a blessing in itself and, and it. that's absolutely why because these these men these women have these lived experiences mm -hmm. through life and they've been able to sort things out and they've thought about things in ways that you haven't even begun to think about how to think about those things right, yet right they they start to answer deep underlying questions about honesty about integrity about serenity which right. i have not met i have not met a person yet usually with five years five uh, five or less years of recovery that know 
even remotely what serenity is, let right. alone how to achieve it. And I haven't usually met like seven or eight years. Like I, I'm still meeting people at 10, 15 years that t- are struggling with serenity, but I've met some people that have serenity. I've met people that have long bouts that still don't have serenity. Mm-hmm. Serenity is, I mean, that is the diamond in the rough. If you can achieve that, right. if you can find that and you can hold on to it and you mm-hmm. can, and you can meld that into who you are and right. become serenity, your life has essentially it's reached its purpose. Right. It's reached what you can truly be. So for the sake of time here too, I want to, I want to put a couple things out about this before we do move on. Um, so like you were saying, we need to break the patterns of isolation of some sort, get into that group. And the other important thing is really cement ourselves into that mm. group at this stage. You need to get involved. You know, if you're, if you're going to 12 steps, start, start doing some service work, start really working with your sponsor, things like that. If you're going to, to smart recovery, you know, really plug in with the people you're going with, get to know the people teaching the class, you know, go to go to those meetings, uh, learn more about cognitive behavioral therapy, like we said. Um, it's just really just whatever it is, get into it and just really concrete yourself into that community. Well, you got it. What do they say? I mean, you got to marinate in it, right? How do you how do you make a steak taste like teriyaki? You marinate it in teriyaki. It's right. the same principle with recovery. How do you get all encompassed in recovery? You got to be in it. Mm-hmm. You got to maintain it. You got to talk to people. You got to be a part of it because that that's and and a quick note and when we'll move on. That's the entire reason that we started this podcast is that recovery is it, it, it's a huge dynamic of people's lives number one but it's a huge subculture mm-hmm. like you you should not feel like you're alone if you're trying to get out of addiction for those of you who might just happen upon this or listen to this or somebody maybe referred them to listen to this guess what there's a lot of people out there that have found recovery and there's a lot more people out there that have found recovery and want to help you absolutely and, and want to show you how to do it they're not going to do it for you you have to do it for yourself once right. again self-discipline you know, responsibility for yourself, mm-hmm. but they're going to help you acquire the tools yeah. to uh, get it, maintain it, achieve it, whatever you want to say. I just bust out the train gun on people. You just bust, <laughs> out, bust out the train gun, and then I get like a large butterfly net, like yeah, the cartoons, exactly. and just swoop them up. And then you wake up and rehab. And then you wake up and rehab. Yeah. Okay. Not everybody can experience recovery like yeah. you did, Hunter. Right. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> for those of you who do not know, Hunter, I believe you. Was it a train gun or how did, how did they get you into rehab? You want the real story? Yeah. Okay. The real story. They dra- didn't, didn't some nice men drag you out of a house. No, no, that's not at all what happened. Um, my aunt and mom physically assaulted. No, I'm just kidding. My aunt and mom <laughs> had a really good conversation with me. And uh, I always said they made it. They like convinced me to go to the treatment. It's kind of funny. Cause uh, literally what they said is like, Hunter, do you have a problem with drugs? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, do you think you can do it on your own? I'm like, no, I don't think I can quit on my own. And they're like, so what are we talking about here? Yeah. <laughs> Good <laughs> <I'm> for like, <laughs> <"Woo."> <laughs> <laughs> That ninja right uh-huh. there. I love that. Right. I love that. All right. So jumping into deepening. Right. Now, deepening is the, this is going to be the one where we're essentially going to start adding rocket fuel to the fire. Right. Because this is where people are usually going to either take off or explode in the atmosphere. Right. Because at this point, they have one to two, getting into three to four years of recovery. Mm-hmm. The reason this can be one of the most dangerous steps is because I've seen too many people who get two years of recovery and then think that's a long time. Right. And then think like, I've got it under control. I've got it under my belt. I mean, not to out you, but think about your situation. I mean, think about your situation, right? You got uh, over two and a half years, Mm -hmm. right? And once you get to that two year mark or what happened? Yeah. When I hit the two year mark, I wasn't going to meetings. I was working in this field. So I'm like, Oh, I'm fine. You know, I'm like, I'm a guy. I talk about recovery every day. And I thought that I was stable and walking the path. And I had so many people in my life, people that I respected their opinion, people I really didn't respect their opinion, but they're all like, you need to do something, you know, like you're heading towards a cliff and you need to stop. And then I didn't, I didn't really listen. I got to the point to where I was like ready to quit my job. I was ready to walk away from the field. I was ready to go back to Iowa, all these things that I really shouldn't have done. And I'm lucky I had a conversation. I had a conversation with Christian here about what I was feeling. He was able to intellectually walk me through like, so you feel like your recovery is really struggling. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, so why would you make decisions in your life right now with your recovery struggling? But that will, that would be a conversation for another podcast, but it was, it was a really big moment in my recovery. And I realized like, Oh wait, I still need all this stuff that got me. Well, just like taking any medication, I'm feeling better now. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to keep taking the medication mm-hmm. that got me well. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I just want to be, be really, really clear uh, for those of you who may have missed it. He said intellectual, and I'm going to hang on to that word. He said intellectually walked you through it. Mm-hmm. So you heard it here first. I'm an intellectual. Thank you. 
that, <laughs> fake news. Fake. <laughs> That's rough. That's rough. <laughs> All right. You don't have to act like that. Okay. Below the belt. So let's jump to deepening. So like I said before, you know, this, this is going to get the place where people are coming off of that pink cloud. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the times they become, you know, lost in the wilderness. They right. start to feel kind of hazy a little bit. They're like, well, I'm not making progress as much as I was before, Mm -hmm. or one of the worst causes, which is they do not have a plan. Now, what is a plan hunter? It's a plan. It's a plan. It's a plan. It's a destination. Um, It's really like kind of, this will get formulated in this stage as much as it might get formulated earlier, but it has to be something, a a longer term goal, kind of like, where do I want to be? What's a long term goal? When you say long term goal, what do you mean a day, a week? Uh, Yes, exactly. No. Um, So like it, maybe a year, maybe five years, maybe 10 years down the road, whatever it is, but something like, uh, what do you call it? A stake in the ground. It's Mm -hmm. something that we can anchor ourselves to and kind of slowly walk towards, right? So we're slowly just step by step walking towards a certain destination. Uh, Like I said, maybe one, maybe two, maybe five, 10 years down the road. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of a, it's just kind of a compass for us. Yes. So, and this is where we start to talk about that, that second portion here. Uh, of the unfulfilled potential, right? So mm-hmm. usually at this point, a lot of times people who found this recovery are able generally in, in very rare circumstances, this doesn't happen. But at this point in their recovery, they're generally able to emotionally unpack things mm-hmm. in a healthy way. Now it doesn't always happen that way. Every once in a while, you'll get somebody who has quite a bout of recovery mm-hmm. under them and they still, maybe nothing major has happened to them over the last couple of years and then like you know a parent or loved one dies and then it's like we're in tragedy mode right um but oftentimes this is where we talk about unfulfilled potential Mm -hmm. this is where people get like what do i do well i will say on the trauma side too this is a point where people start to finally get rid of that emotional stuff that's going on this is really where people get really deep into what their trauma was yes and start really just pouring it out there that emotional detox you could say yes and yeah. and along often in the stage you have what the tolerance to feelings you're able mm-hmm. to understand things you're able to unpack things in a much right. more healthy manner you know the difference between feelings you know you, you can d- differentiate like okay i'm angry but I'm angry because I felt challenged and that made me feel belittled, which made me scared. Yes. You know, it's like, you can really trace it back to that primary feeling. Absolutely. And it's right in the name it's deepening. Mm -hmm. So just as Hunter said, you're able to identify and then you're able to use the words because Mm -hmm. I feel this way because of this, 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 I used because of this, 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 this. And, and by doing that, it allows you to have a lot more stability in your life because Mm -hmm. when you're able to identify those things, maybe causes to the root of of your anxiety, causes to the root of your depression, causes to the root of of your use, when you're able to identify those things, Mm -hmm. they become integrated into your being, right? You know, and that's not to say they're a part of the integration step. No, but they're integrated into your being so that they're no longer that baggage. They're no Mm -hmm. longer that, you know, dusty old box that is sticking up inside of the attic that it's like, if I opened it, it'd be like, what's in this, right? So like, (laughs) it's no longer that it's able to open those things up and say, you know, this yes happened to me, or yes, I did this thing, or I said Mm -hmm. these things, or I was a part of this thing. And now I am no longer doing that. Oftentimes we talk about um, executive functioning too mm-hmm. at this point. So uh, executive functioning, one of the portions of executive functioning, although there's a lot there is the ability to not future trip, but see into the future. Right. Now I don't mean see into the future as if I'm like, you know, look into my crystal ball, <laughs> little boy, like, <laughs> but much more, you know, it's, it's a sense of like, I know where I'm going to be an hour from now. Mm -hmm. I know where I'm going to be, you know, later on today, tomorrow, Mm -hmm. whatever it might be. And not having this sense of like, oh, one more day, one more minute, one more day, one more minute. And that's okay. Right. We say that a lot into recovery. It's just like, you know, one day at a time. Yeah. And when that's too much, one minute or one or one second of one minute. Yeah. And and we go, we go by that. But usually when we get to this point, we're thinking a little bit further ahead of that, you know, and that's not to say, it's horrific that you might not be thinking that far ahead. But when you're getting to this point in your recovery, you may have to ask yourself why you're continuing to live life like that. If right. it's like one more, one more second, one more second, one more second. It's like, there's something that's bad there. Yeah. That, it's, that's almost like a white knuckling that, that, that reminds me of like a white knuckling mentality that's going to be happening at, at what is this like three, four years into recovery? Yeah. There's just, there's something there that needs to be checked. And I think anyone who made it that far would probably identify that as well. I would assume at that point, but right. you know, we don't always want to, we, we try not to paint in broad strokes. So 
um, you know, there's, there's going to, there's going to be people that do somewhat have the mentality, but for, for the greater portion of people at this point, their executive functioning is really starting to kick in mm -hmm. and they've started to get a plan for their life. Right. They've started to get things, you know, worked out and, and, and know where they're supposed to be in the next hour, in the next couple hours. Now, there is one thing that I will suggest to every person who is in recovery at this point, And I tell it to every class. I tell it to recoveries. I try to get it early on in recovery, but oftentimes if you reach this point, if you've reached deepening in your recovery, get a schedule, get either put it in your phone or get a paper schedule, but get a schedule, get something in your life that you can open up or, or look at and say, I know where I'm going to be today. Mm -hmm. Or when you're having a conversation with somebody and they say, what are you doing for lunch tomorrow? You're able to say, Hey, really quick, let me look. I can't, I got to go to the doctors or I can't, I got to mm -hmm. work or I can't, I got to get this project done or I can't, I have another meeting. I mean, Hunter will first, <laughs> we'll, we'll ask you, what do you think about schedules? And then we'll, I'll ask you another question. I don't like where this is going. I think sch <laughs> schedules. This, this is my master plan. Yeah. I brought this entire podcast to fruition so that I can <laughs> ask this one question to him and publish it. So I have a schedule and without that schedule, it is very hectic, you know, like, especially in recovery coach role. It's like, I got, I'm meeting a client at 10, I'm meeting a client at 11, I'm meeting a client at 12, and then I'm going on lunch, then I'm coming back and I'm running the class, you know, and it's like, I, mean, I, I got, got stuff to do after work that right. I can't, do, you know, and it's like, it gets, it gets very hectic. And I've, I've gone without a schedule before. And then I literally forgot that I was supposed to be teaching a class. I think we both experienced, I, I believe you were part of that conversation too. And being my boss, you were probably part of it. Um, you know, and <laughs> he's like, wait, what? No. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, life gets chaotic if you don't have something there to be like, Oh yeah, I'm going to this because otherwise double, double commitments, double booking, it starts to happen. Cause at this point in your recovery, man, there there's stuff going on. Things mm -hmm. are moving, right? You got, you got a busy life. Like we said, responsibility comes in the last step. So at this stage you're maintaining that responsibility. And here's the thing. We're not necessarily talking to just the, the younger crowd by any means. It's like, you know, you need to know if you have doctor's appointments right. so that you can make sure that you have that time to meet with your sponsee or that mm -hmm. your sponsor, like these are all things that you want to make sure that you have not. It's a good discipline to start having. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you can ask Hunter, what does my schedule look like? I don't know. If you yeah. ever open my an, book, he's got an Oxford, yeah, Oxford calendar. Is that yes. what it's called? Yeah. So it's like looked booked out every 30 minutes and it's always like written in and all crossed down. And is there, how much is in there? I don't know a lot. A There's lot. quite a bit of stuff. It's a in novel. There. Yeah. It's an entire, but it's a, with a novel with notes on, right. on what I'm supposed to be talking about so that when I go into the meeting, I can read some really quick and just jog the memory and run in and mm -hmm. be like, okay, I remember what I'm supposed to be saying here. That's nothing to say of us, but it is to say, especially with the younger crowd, invest in the calendar, invest in the schedule, do this thing right. Start mm -hmm. to book yourself out. Start to understand that you got to take, you got to be the first person to take yourself seriously. And that goes just as much as your recovery, as it does your as your work life, as it does your social life, as it does your love life. You got to take yourself seriously in these things because the laissez-faire days, because I don't, I, let me preface it with this. I don't know about you, Hunter. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a schedule when I was using. Mm -hmm. It was like, wake up, do what I want, watch right. some cartoons, eat some cocoa puffs, smoke and, mm -hmm. and drink. And, you know, uh, all I knew is that I was going to be going to bed anywhere from the hours of 10 o'clock to three in the morning, somewhere right. in that area. I'll see if I can book it in. Yeah. I don't know about you. Yeah. Mine was more like the wake up, try to get drugs. And then five days from now, I might take a 30 minute nap. I don't know. <laughs> difference in drugs yeah right different yeah. substances yeah no <laughs> no one life better than the other yeah. um no but one thing that i noticed though now that i'm here is like i i do not have the luxury to do that i i need to be scheduled out right. i need to have my life set and here's the thing and I, once again i know about you hunter if I don't have my schedule with me, I start to feel some anxiety. Yeah. I'm just like, Oh no, what am I doing today? Because the problem is the, the, those, the things that I write in that book are mm -hmm. a visual representation of commitments that I've made to other right. people and, and to myself. Man, you know? It's about integrity. Right. It is a portion of my recovery. Mm -hmm. That schedule is as stupid and as trivial that we might be, you might feel for those of you who are listening of us going off the beaten path here a little bit. It's like mm -hmm. that right there 
it signifies integrity. It mm-hmm. signifies your recovery. It signifies your ability to make promises and commitments to yourself and other people, write it down so you remember, and then actually attend those things and right. make sure that those relationships are attended to. Right. Are we going to talk about how I was an hour late today? Gonna... Yeah. Well, we can also talk about that. I, I give him, I give him a break because it's Saturday. Uh, it's Saturday. Yeah, right, so it's, right. it's, it is what it is. But, um, when it comes down to, so for those of you listening, uh, we filmed a little bit ahead of time. It's right, Saturday. Right. So, uh, but when we're talking about deepening, there's, there's th- this complete understanding of your feelings, the person who you mm-hmm. are, you are going to have, you are more than a two dimensional being. Right. You are more than a three dimensional being. You are somebody who, who is worthy of love, mm-hmm. who is worthy of the recovery that they're now pursuing, who is worthy of making change and can make the change not only for themselves, but the world around them. Right but they got to get really clear. Mm-hmm. So I, I would say to recoveries at this stage, you know, I, I and I've had several of them where I have to sit them down and I almost got to shake them mm-hmm. and be like, you are now obligated to the world around you. You, you are now obligated to, to change. You guys know he doesn't actually shake his clients. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, violations here. <laughs> yeah. But um, you are not obligated to change. You are not obligated to to shape the world around you, you know, and it, and that goes everywhere from the person that's living down in their parents' basement to the person that's got, you know, a six figure job and both of them are in recovery. Like, what are you doing for the world around you? What are you doing to improve the world? Are you just making money so that you can, you know, live, eke out an existence? Right. Are you making change? Are you making change in your family's life and your life and other recoveries you might be influencing around you, your right. friends, your sponsor, your sponsees? Right. And main, maintenance isn't a bad thing, but yeah, in this stage of recovery, it's like, we, we talk about that on that potential. It's like, whatever you want to do, whoever you, you know, if you want to affect people, whatever it is, or you want to, you want to go out in the woods and kind of disappear and live your own life, whatever it is, it's about a progression towards that point, a deepening into that point, right? So it's like, I have a goal, whatever it is, I don't care what it, what your, or what your goal is, wherever you want to be, but you have to be pushing towards that thing. Absolutely. Right. And it it's carving it out mm-hmm. because it isn't something that is going to come easy. And that's definitely one of the things that I think we have to, we have to give to recoveries in the deepening session and re- give to loved ones whose recoveries, uh, you know, whose, whose recoveries you might see in your lives, mm-hmm. you know, your, your, closest loved ones, your, your parents or your children, and you're seeing them in recovery for a decent amount of time, but you, you see that their, their attitudes or their emotions are start changing. Mm -hmm. And, and they've been in recovery for a couple of years now. And they, yes, they're doing good work, but here's a couple of really, really important things for, I would say in particular parents to children, you need to check in on them Mm -hmm. just because they have two years, three years, four years of recovery does not mean that they're not still struggling and certainly does not mean that there isn't thoughts there. Yeah. I mean, I still, from time to time, I still have thoughts of using, and I'm sure you do too, from time to time, you know, not me, no, but okay. Yeah. Other people, you know, (laughs) other people, excluding me, I'm kind of unique. (laughs) Yeah. No, but there's, there's going to be things here that, that are going to be challenging are going to be challenging to work through with, if you have somebody in your family or a loved one or, or a child that is struggling with this, things that still need to be worked through here, just because they've stopped using for three years does not mean by any means that the work is done. Like the work has to continue to progress on. Right. And one, one unique thing that we usually see around this area is the, uh, you know, the advent of using dreams. Mm-hmm. We see a lot of using dreams around here. Right. First and foremost, let me tell you, using dreams aren't bad. No. Now there's a couple of schools of thought. Um, and, and I definitely check, I would tell you to check out using dreams. You can just throw it into Google. There's been uh, different pieces of scientific literature that have been put about mm-hmm. it. But one of the schools of thought that I definitely uh, uh, subscribe to, and I think because I've experienced it myself, is that ultimately using dreams come down to one of two outcomes, which is when you used in that dream, how did you feel? How right. did you wake up? How did you feel when you woke up? Exactly. That's yeah. really all it comes down to, because if you felt like you needed to get the drug when you woke up, there's a big problem. Mm-hmm. You know, that's self-fulfilling prophecy time. That's like, you need to you need to check in with your your support systems. You need to start using every tool in your toolbox to really get your recovery back under control. And that's a lot that can end up happening when when an individual has sliding off the beaten path and they've not gone to their meetings, they've not participated in recovery for a while or active recovery. So they need to get that going. The second thing, excuse me. Uh, the second thing that. Uh, uh, individuals need to understand is that if they wake up and they have anxiety about the dream, that's okay. Yeah. If 
I've heard it's a, a one thing I've heard on some peer rev- or review journals is like about and yeah I said that I'm fancy I'm an intellectual <laughs> now um, when you says he's an intellectual he means I made him read peer review journals pretty much yeah so um that it's a it's a brain's way of handling trauma or high stress situations it's like a reminder almost of your brain saying like hey don't do that you're going to this kind of high stress situation please don't do this to me again you know like mm-hmm. yeah absolutely so it, it is the brain's way of essentially uh mending itself mm-hmm. and enforcing you know forcing an outcome mm-hmm. and it's a way it's essentially the brain tricking its way into mending and healing itself of like yeah. don't do this you know the outcomes yada 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 so and those are all really good things yeah those are all things that are, are very positive. But the reason we say all this is because during deepening, this is what a recovery can go through. So as a parent, as a loved one, if somebody is coming to you about this or you hear about this, do not freak out. Do not immediately right. go into nuclear option. They're going to use again. They've been dreaming right. about it, which means they've been thinking about it. That's not always right. the case. And I would say that most people, if you don't have experience in recovery, when you hear somebody's having using dreams and you don't know much about the science behind it, that's going to throw major red flags. Like big you're time. dreaming about getting high now, you know, like that, that would scare me if I didn't know about it. Big time, big time. And ultimately one thing that we'll start to really see inside of, uh, of the deepening motif, if mm-hmm. you will, is the, the starting to commit to honesty and Absolutely. integrity. Well, not just honesty and integrity, but seeing the entirety of our behavior start to change. Cause yes. this is that stage where we really start to be like, Oh, I don't like that part about myself. I don't like that I do that, whether it be lying or whatever, not showing up on time. So honesty, integrity, but also maybe not showing up on time. Get out of my house. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, you know, maybe it, it could be a plethora of different behaviors that you're displaying that you start to realize like, oh, that's not okay. Right. Yes. And, and it's all a part of the, that deepening sense of we start to look at those things in those behaviors inside of ourselves. And we ask ourselves a couple of different questions now. Before, before we end here, I'm going to ask these questions, but the really thing I want to draw focus to this, because Mm -hmm. if you're a recovery and you haven't asked yourself these questions yet, or your recovery and these behaviors exist in you Mm -hmm. that you do not like. And what we mean by behavior you do not like is essentially if a, if a behavior that you're partaking or participating in draws anxiety out of you, draws a feeling of uncomfort or a feeling of regret, Mm -hmm. That is your body and your mind telling you that this is against your moral code, that this is against your ethical code, that this is not who you really are or who you're striving to be. I want to throw out the first and most important question everyone needs to ask in recovery, and that's if a woodchuck could chuck wood indeed, how much wood would it chuck? That is not at all what I was was going to say. I was just throwing it out there. No. Well, the first question is, is where does the feeling strand from? Mm -hmm. So once again, Oftentimes the feeling of anxiety, of frustration towards the oneself because of the behavior that we've just committed, that is directly, that is directly from the, the parts of your brain, the parts of you, the integrated you saying, this is not who you are. Mm-hmm. This is not what, what we want you to do. This is not how you want to behave. This is not how you want to change the world. This is not how you want to be perceived. These are all things that, that really come to the forefront. Uh, if, if, um, if you want to learn a lot more about this, uh, uh, Carl Jung, um, Jungian psychology does quite a, a significant uh, amount about it. it's called integrating the shadow. It's a difficult read, but there's a lot of pieces of literature on that. So just type in Jung integration of the shadow and you'll see what we're talking about because essentially the shadow is that, that part of us that we do not like and our ability to integrate that is directly related to how successful we can become in life or how, how, how approachable of a human being we can become. But the second thing, after you ask yourself, where does this come from is why am I doing it? Hmm. What, what is the cause of me doing it? And more oftentimes than not, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to sidestep it for you a little bit. It's probably fear. If you're lying, it's probably defense fear. Mechanism, right? It this is a defense yeah. mechanism. It is you retreating back into an old way of being, or you retreating into a way that is going to allow you mm-hmm. to sidestep consequences. Right. Something that's worked for a lot of years, right? Exactly. Yeah. And the, the best thing, the third thing that you can do after you've identified, you know, what is it that I have a problem with it? Why is it that I have this exact problem is how do I change it? Absolutely. What, what do I do to need to change it? Mm-hmm. Now, for those of you who might've heard my interview, um, which would have been last Friday, I believe. Yep. It would have been last Friday. Um, you know, that the way that I went about changing things is I committed to radical honesty. Mm-hmm regardless of what circumstances, regardless of how it was going to, the trouble that it would get me in. And guess what? 
the radical honesty forced me to dig myself out of many holes that I had created for myself because right. of the lie and cheat and stealing. Mm -hmm. And over time, I became on the mend. Mm -hmm. Over time, I was able to, to dig my way out of those things. And now people trust me. Now people see me as an honest individual. Now people know that I'm not lying to them. Now people know that if I'm saying to something to them, I believe it. it doesn't necessarily make it absolutely true, but I believe it to be true. Right. Um, and I, and Hunter will tell you, I'll more than willing to admit, like, I'm not positive about this, or right. that makes a lot of sense, or I'm not quite sure. Right. Um, but just in identifying the behavior, seeing how it made me feel, and then making a commitment to myself about how I was going to change it, that made a world of difference. Right. And I saw my life change behind it. And one thing for people in recovery who may be in this moment right now, thinking like, well, I have this behavior about me. I'm lying a lot. You know, I'm swearing a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm doing things a lot that I don't want to do. And I'm not saying anything's really bad. I'm just saying maybe there's something in your life that you want to change. The best thing that you can do is just try it for a week. All right. And find some accountability too can really help someone to check in with you and be like, so how are you doing with that thing? You know, or somebody catches you cussing and they just like just punch you in the face. No, I don't find that person. Don't, but, don't do that. Don't, <laughs> don't do, do that. that. Um, that's assault. Um, yeah. but, but you know, find somebody who can help hold you accountable or help, help lift you up and kind of walk this path with you a little bit. Cause there's a lot of people out there that are willing to do that. Sponsors, friends, family, maybe your spouse, whoever it is. Yeah. And, and by doing that, you've created that responsibility to somebody else that mm -hmm. can help you quite a bit. But like I said, do it for a week, Right. do it for a week. See what, see what the difference is. Yeah. Do it for a week. And I'm not saying, I am not saying make huge amends during the week. You don't have to go to you know, your best friend that has stopped talking to you and telling him like, I stole from, you know, a thousand dollars from you right. so I could get high. Like you don't need to do that, but at least for one week, try not lying. Mm -hmm. At least for one week, try cussing less, at least for one week. Try if, if you feel it necessary to bend the truth, try in your brain, not necessarily, it doesn't have to be a live exercise, but how would I say this in such a way that at least it's true enough for me to believe. Right. Like, and by doing that, you're making a slow change in yourself and, you know, wrapping it all back around to our, our stage of change. It is deepening. Mm -hmm. It is a deepening sense of I'm going to become a different person who right. I was, and I'm going to uncover the person that I was always meant to be. Right, right. And I really like um, one more thing we want to iterate here. And I really like how Christian brought this to light earlier on is all this stuff takes time, right? So as we're, we're going through these stages of change and stages of recovery in a matter of, you know, four podcasts. Mm -hmm this takes years. And that's okay. You know, like, like Christian's saying, you're not going to go and make those huge amends in one week. You know, it's not like you're going to change your completely change a habit that you've had for years over the period of a uh, two week time. You know, yeah. this takes a long time. It takes repeated uh, behaviors, just kind of slowly over time, training yourself not to use those negative coping mechanisms that we use long enough. hundred percent, hundred percent. So with that being said, uh, I, you know, thank everybody for, for listening in. If you're, interested in catching the second part of this you can uh, tune in next monday or tune in this wednesday we'll be talking about some meditation questions deeper philosophical questions as we do with that being said we will see you later have a great day